Sanctuary, oh, this is a great question for the future governor. Are sanctuary cities real or overblown GOP fear-mongering? Completely overblown GOP fear-mongering. It's just a fact. And they don't look at the facts. They don't actually look at the ordinances. What? It's complete, uh, it's, it's hyperbolic uh, misinformation. And it's very difficult to get into the weeds because no two sanctuary cities are alike. They're close to 300. Now, how would you define it for people who haven't uh, been following so it? So, I, I define it the way Rudy Giuliani, who was a big proponent of sanctuary cities, is that would right? have defined it in well. New York, as almost every major city mayor is, Republican and Democrat. The bottom line is you want the folks in your city, regardless of how they got there, regardless of their status, to cooperate with law enforcement. Right. If someone is raped, if someone is in a domestic abuse situation, you want them to cooperate with police. But if you're concerned about someone right. in the family being deported, you're less likely I to see. be cooperative. So as a consequence, sanctuary cities provide a framework for that kind of engagement. What they do not do is sanction people that are here with violent criminal records or in jail for felonies to be released. There are, however, some exceptions, and that's where this tragedy in San Francisco fell. And there are gaps that need to be closed unquestionably, but there's a lot of mythology on this. Oh, well, that cleared up a lot of it. And, um, and I assume some of them are good people. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> Thank you, Doc. <Okay. laughs> Uh, Caitlin, how can universities distance themselves from the lingering power of fraternities? Well, that's a great question because fraternities are kind of like Donald Trump. Like in a world where that's too politically correct, people go to some jackass because, oh, it is a breath of fresh air from political correctness. Right, exactly. And the universities really can't distance themselves. Those kids have a constitutionally protected right to the freedom of association. Sure, They're allowed to join any club they want. Right. But you'll certainly find, I mean, their vile, hideous um, Terrible. language that they use is really the only expression of free speech that you'll find on many campuses. And the real right. problem with what's going on with this political correctness is that when you can't talk about things in the open, when you drive it underground, it festers. And kids start to think there's some kind of secret knowledge to be able to get together behind the closed doors <laughs> of a fraternity sure. and use the N-word or you know right. s speak about horribly misogynist comments. They start to think, oh, we're really powerful. We know the truth behind our closed doors. So there's a right. real symbiotic relationship between between the fraternity, out of control fraternities, and the political correctness, I think. Hmm. Okay. Um, Michael, what do you make of the recent study that says sea levels are rising at a faster rate than we first anticipated? Will we have to evacuate our coastal cities? Well, there was a recent article by James Hansen, who uh, we talked about earlier, yes. uh, has been extremely prescient in what he has predicted in the past about climate change. So anytime he says something, you want to listen very carefully to him. Um, he has argued that we could see as much as six feet of sea level rise, uh, which, you know, if you think, you look at uh, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, just that one foot of sea level rise that we've had already meant that there were uh, 25 square miles of additional flooding uh, along New York City, uh, the New Jersey coast. Uh, it also meant that there was something like seven and a half billion dollars uh, more damage done by that storm. So if that's what one foot does, imagine what six feet do. Now, what do it do? <laughs> six uh, feet would mean that you're basically starting uh, to abandon uh, many of our coastal cities uh, really? because of the, not just the inundation. How far inland? Well, it depends on the topography. I mean, uh, with... Uh, but my lawn would get water. Southern Florida is very flat. Um, so, you know, six feet of sea level rise uh, inundates, you know, a good chunk of the southern part of Florida. But seriously, how, how far inland? Like... West Hollywood. <laughs> you'll, you'll, probably, you'll probably be okay here, but you know, again, that damage is damage that reverberates through our economy, through the global economy. We all end up paying uh, for the damages that climate change does anywhere, whether it's our coastlines or you know, here in California, where we are seeing unprecedented drought and wildfire. And that is uh, a problem for the rest of the country because this is where we get a lot of our, uh, you know, our, our, our um, fruit and uh, nuts. Sure. Um, oh, there's a lot of fruit a lot and of nuts, nuts in California. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Walk right, right into, into that one. Of course you did, Doc. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> what, 
Will Joe Biden entering the race, if he does, derail Hillary Clinton's campaign? Well, it, it won't be good news for it, right? You can look at it in a number of ways. In many ways, it may sharpen the debate, may sharpen her message, uh, may create a diffusion in terms of the uh, targeting uh, coming from the Republicans, uh, because they'll have to target a number of other candidates, or at least Joe Biden himself. Uh, so you can look at it in multiple ways. I, I don't think he'll run, uh, but I hope he doesn't run just because of what happened to his son. I hope he runs because he thinks he'll make a difference right. and be an outstanding president. And so it's, uh, it's a tough choice because he's run twice, as you know, 87 and, uh, and during your 2000 campaign. And you know, campaign. I mean, you probably uh, were aware I did something about Governor Brown, your boss, your immediate boss, defending him vigorously against the charge of ageism. In yeah. fact, it's in Playboy this month. They reprinted a lot of it, right. um, saying that if he was 43 instead of 73, the guy who turned around the biggest state in yeah. the country and the eighth largest economy would be absolutely viable as no a question. presidential candidate. And uh, there is no reason why somebody his age can't do the job. It's completely relative. I remember Bobby Kennedy said someone, what the world needs are the qualities of youth, not a time of life, but a state of mind, right. a quality of imagination. And Jerry Brown sort of proves that point. And I would argue, and, and, but it's, and, and I would argue to counter, I think Rubio proves the point in the other degree. I don't think his points of view represent uh, right. state of mind that is no. as progressive as his age right. and Not that the way he's he packages young. himself. It's that he's dumb. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a very important question because Trump is 69, Hillary is 69, yep. Bernie Sanders is 73, yep. and Joe Biden is 72 or 73. So we have all these people around this age, and none of them seem like they couldn't do the job. You got it. How old was McCain when... When McCain was 72. 72. 72 yeah. when he ran? McCain was 72. Oh, wow. How old? Seemed like 300. Yeah. yeah. Oh, didn't <laughs> <laughs> seem like 300. <laughs> um, it, yes, it he, he did seem old. Yeah. And Reagan was 69 when Reagan he ran? Reagan was 69. Right. Yeah. Well, Hillary would be the same. Maybe. Right. Yeah. He did McCain, not. by the way, was an example of a Republican who was extremely good on climate change. At one point. Well, you know, I don't think he's changed his views. I think he's um, maybe a little quieter about it now. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gavin, do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana? In uh, as, as some folks may know, uh, we're uh, very likely to have a ballot initiative in 2016 to tax and regulate marijuana for adults. And, uh, and we have strong confidence we'll win. We'll, we've got to do it right and be thoughtful and, and deal with the legitimate concerns folks have about our children and not allowing to big tobacco to come in, become big marijuana. Right. So we want to do it in a very thoughtful way and uh, we'll have that opportunity next year. And you're for it. Uh, leading, the, leading the effort. Right. I know you yeah. always have been, yeah. yeah. And uh, that would be good because, I mean, four states have it legal now. Yeah. Um, California, which has been on the forefront of so many things, Yep. has been lagging on this. We yeah. weren't close to being first on gay marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to start calling us West Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, I mean, the thing about it is marijuana is already legal in California in the way that you used to have to buy a beer in Utah, right? You have to sign up for the membership club is and then they right would pour you, pour you a drink. Wow. California, you have to jump through the hoop. You get your right. prescription and, and you get it. And I think as a country, is this really what we want to spend $50 billion no. a year on? Fueling an enormous law enforcement bureaucracy, the militarization of police departments as they sees, um, you know, as they, the rationale for, well, this is why we need an armored personnel carrier to enforce the drug warrant for a nonviolent marijuana offender and the civil asset forfeiture that comes along with it. And for a conservative concerned about the size and growth of government, this is something you should absolutely be for yes. because it's one of the most effective ways of reducing the size and scope and influence and hypocrisy of government. Right. I've said that years ago, that the, this is a, an issue the Republicans could have stolen yeah. from the Democrats. Yeah. Absolutely. Alternate Free, freedom of issue. big government. Okay. Right. Rand Paul is, has this. It's in his platform. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, he also has a giant cash crop of cannabis in Kentucky. <laughs> Say that 12 times fast. What do you mean? There, he's, a giant cash crop there, of cannabis? Do you want to go visit Kentucky? Yes, it's a, it's a cannabis growing state. I'm Bluegrass. sorry, I'll probably get sued for this. <laughs> well, um, but, well, lots of states, they grow it, but you mean secretly. 
Well, I guess since it's not legal there yet, but I can't imagine other than his being a libertarian, although I agree you with You seem Steve to know a lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm saying this as a mother, in addition to what Steve is saying, these kids are going to try it, yeah. and I'd rather they, yeah. it, there be some regulatory oversight of it and stop wasting money overcrowding our prisons and creating criminals and such. Yeah. And you know, you make a point. I, and as a parent, to your point, without belaboring this, and, and you, I, 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 hey, I'm, I, I love this panel. I'm impressed uh, the two of you have this point of view. Uh, but, you know, drug dealers don't card. Uh, they don't care how old you are. They don't care what you're selling. They sure don't. Uh, and, uh, and so from a parent's perspective, I, I, right. I, I appreciate that point of view. And so, look, the thing about California, though, one should not underestimate the impact this will have, not only across the country, but around the world, notably with the cartels down in Mexico. We produce just in the Emerald Triangle, which is that Mendocino, Humboldt area of California, roughly $12 billion of cannabis uh, at wholesale a year. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, we make the rest of the world, yeah. So this, this the impact of, of what we do will be much more significant, certainly than, I would argue, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska combined. So uh, it's a very, very serious debate for serious people, and I hope we don't demean the debate by talking about stoners and talking no. about hippies and uh, the usual rhetoric. That's In a good uh, baby. Yeah. No, I hate that. And, and, and to your point, you know, the, the, the dispensaries, you're right. It, it makes me feel dishonest and like a criminal. Because I genuinely suffer from whatever it is I told them I had. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.